All right, well, we're gonna get started here. Today is uh, the monthly webinar we try to do. Um, I'm Dr. Warner, Warner Orthopedics and Wellness in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Also co-founder of the Healing Soul and Well Theory, which is, um, they're both part of my whole concept of fundamental natural health, like trying to help you help yourself as opposed to needing to come to people like me. This is my clinic uh, with a lot of intentional design features that promote health and wellness, like natural light, um, nice colors, aromatherapy, things like that. Um, and we are in Baton Rouge, as I said, and this is my partner, Dr. Lindo on the bottom. And I've got an amazing team that I work with, staff and um, a wonderful nurse, Lauren Broussard, who works with me. So if you are in need of services in the Louisiana region, we are always there for you. Today, I'm gonna to talk about the brain and mindset. And you may be wondering, why is an orthopedic surgeon gonna talk about this? But I can tell you that I've learned over my years that the number one thing that matters in how someone does is not me, not my surgical technique, not uh, my ability to diagnose the issue, not my ability to read the imaging, uh, but the most important factor in anybody's ability to get better over any given condition is the person themselves and how they think about things and their beliefs, their mindset, and sort of the way they conceptualize their health in general. Um, so what I want to teach you today is how most of how you feel, pain included, and how you do in terms of any disease, it, it's really up to you. And I'm going to tell you why that is. The new science that is proving this to be the case and more and more information comes out every week, honestly, we'll probably have to update this talk at least once a year. And then tricks you can use to fight back against the mind control that is currently being used against you by the medical industry, the food industry, the entertainment industry, the pharma pharmacologic industry, et cetera. So I want you to take back the control, but until you understand it, you won't be able to. So hopefully this kind of will give you a broad overview of the topic. So today is brain and mindset. So mindset, I want you to understand how you can use your mindset to get better. Uh, this is a depiction of the brain with the different uh, pain patterns and the cognition related to pain. Pain being a subjective experience, meaning it is not objective. There's no test for it. Pain is 100% purely subjective, meaning it is all controlled and characterized by your brain and how your brain decides to make you feel that perception. Um, and pain is probably one of the best examples to use of how mindset can control things. But honestly, a good mindset can control blood pressure, can control your response to cancer therapeutics, can control how your gut works, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to talk about a mindset fix versus growth mindset, which is also in the health world, a sickly versus a health mindset. So do you want to live in the world of a sick role? Do you always want to be sick? Is that how you identify yourself? Or do you want to be a healthy person? Do you want to have a fixed mindset where nothing changes and you're just sort of controlled by the world? Or do you want to have a growth mindset where you can take opportunities, you could take chaos and you can learn from it and move and become a better person and more successful? And this is a fundamental difference between being optimistic and pessimistic. Now there's some flexibility there. You don't wanna be 100% crazy optimistic all the time, nor do you wanna be cons consistently negative. You wanna have kind of a flexibility there. But generally speaking, the more optimistic you are, the more of a growth mindset and a health mindset you will have. And this comes down to what? Neuroplasticity and neuromodulation. What is neuroplasticity? Neuro is brain, plastic means changeable, formable. So more and more information is coming out all the time about how the brain can change. You can change how all the pathways work, the electrical connections, which means if you change how one circuit moves an electrical signal around, you can change the results uh, for any given condition. <clears throat> and then neuromodulation, meaning your brain modifies or modulates any given nociceptive pain signal. So just, I'm gonna give you one simple example. Let's say you get a paper cut, that hurts, ouch. What do you, what's the first thing you do reflexively? You grab your finger and you hold it tight, right? Why? Because that pressure signal is using different nerve fiber tracks that overpower and modify, they inhibit the pain signals. So just simply by pressing your finger, you can change how your brain perceives the pain. You still have the paper cut, nothing's changed, but suddenly you feel differently about it. 
You see what I mean? That's just the simplest example I could give you to understand how powerful the brain really is in changing how the brain feels. So the brain is in control of everything because that's all there is, is the brain, right? And then I'm gonna give you strategies of how you can use these things to, to help yourself. <clears throat> so what is a mindset? There's some technical definitions, but fundamentally it is a set of beliefs or attitudes. So think about that. It's just what you believe and your attitudes. Obviously you can change what you believe and obviously you can change your attitudes, right? I mean, at least I hope you know you can do that. So you can change your mindset. If you currently think that you have a negative mindset, it is possible to change it. If you think you have a positive mindset, great. And we're gonna just expand on that. Um, but what you need to understand is your attitudes and beliefs or your mindset affect every single thing in your life, every domain in your life. They affect what you feel, what you think, all of your perceptions, how you move in the world, how you function in the world. I lost the talk. Um, and your mindset can affect your response to treatments, your outcomes from any given procedure. Um, and I see this all the time. And in the literature, it's starting to come out more and more and more, particularly in orthopedics. We're way behind in the, in the world of how the brain affects health. But <clears throat> if you have a good mindset, you're going to have a good result from surgery. If you don't, you won't. I mean, it's just that that is what it is. So we're going to try to get on the right side here. And I'm going to show you in the next slide where the fixed mindset is and where we're going to go to the growth mindset. So what needs to change in terms of mindset or your set of beliefs and attitudes to achieve optimal health? Remember, my goal in life is optimal aging, optimal health. I just want to be the best I can be. I want my friends and family to be the best they can be. Um, and part of that is to be healthy. In fact, without focusing on good health, you really aren't going to be super successful anywhere else, right? And this is particularly true when it comes to mindset, your set of beliefs and attitudes. So we want people to go from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset, from negative to positive, from a mindset of being just a worker bee to being more entrepreneurial on how you think about things, from a scarcity mindset, like a zero sum game mindset to an abundance mindset, from threat to challenge, and from being mindless to mindful. So I don't want you to be like this picture on the left where you're in a dark room, no natural light, getting constant um, dopamine rewards on an unpredictable pattern, which has been engineered by the geniuses that run casinos. They know that they're going to control your brain that way and trick you into getting addicted to this game and continue to just give them more and more money. I want you out of that environment. I want you to not be controlled and to not uh, succumb to the dopamine reward pathways that are being used against you. I want you to use them for yourself. I want you to be out in nature with friends and family, socializing, having long lasting relationships. All of that's been shown to improve longevity more than anything, to improve health and wellness and a health mindset. And you can change from the fixed negative worker bee scarcity threat mindless world to the growth positive entrepreneurial abundant challenge and mindful world with just some few simple tricks. It's not gonna happen overnight, but it is possible. Uh, but first, let's talk about what is health? What is well being? What does that even mean? So, for the medical industry, all that health is is the absence of disease. So, the example that I think would make the most sense to you is the RDAs, the recommended daily allowance for certain vitamins and minerals. For instance, the RDA for vitamin C is set just so you don't have scurvy. I don't know if anybody out there knows what scurvy is. Scurvy is when you're vitamin C deficient and like your gums start bleeding and tissues just fall apart because vitamin C is fundamental for collagen cross-linking. That's why I put it into my uh, connective tissue multi for post-op recovery from surgery. Without enough vitamin C, the collagen doesn't cross-link properly and tissues just fall apart. Well, for the medical world, for the government, for the RDA, as long as you have enough vitamin C to not actually have scurvy, uh, then you're healthy. To me, that's not enough. I mean, for me personally, certainly not for my kids, certainly not for my friends and family. For me, health is more than simply the absence of disease. It is physical health. It is being safe. It is having social and emotional health. It is having spiritual wellness. It's a personal sense of well-being, like you just feel good. You feel happy, like you don't feel like anything's wrong. Uh, financial health is hugely important and feeling great, okay? Mental and emotional well-being are mandatory for good physical health. So 
for me, for you to get optimal health with all of that, you have to get your mindset right. The brain has to be working properly or none of this is achievable. And this comes down to purposeful and meaningful contributions to life, good relationships, family and friends. Remember, there's that Harvard study that's now 85 years long. That is showing the number one determinant of a long, healthy life is the number of solid, good relationships you have more than anything else. OK, which is one of the reasons I believe that the Mediterranean diet is so successful is because it promotes cooking whole foods with friends and family and developing those social connections. Coping with stress. This is part of mental health. If you don't cope with stress well, guess what? You're filled with cortisol. What does cortisol do? It destroys you effectively over time. You're supposed to have one cortisol spike in the morning to wake you up. You're supposed to get things revved up and going, but you're not supposed to have cortisol constantly all the time. So you have to have good mental health to cope with stress, to get the cortisol down, to reduce inflammation, to get good physical health, to get all this other stuff on the, li the le uh, list on the left. Remember, our goal is not simply the absence of disease. It is health and wellness. I want you to realize your full potential and that perform well. Now, if you get this is a picture of a cancer cell. OK, things are going to happen. It happens to all of us. You never know. You're going to I mean, a car accident, anything could happen tomorrow. Right. But if you can control your mindset and get things right, you're going to have better outcomes from any given adverse event that occurs. OK, so if you have a brain, which I'm assuming that everybody out there does, then you have mental health. Mental health is a state of well-being in which an individual realizes his or her own abilities, can cope with normal stress, probably can cope with abnormal stress, too, can be productive and is able to make meaningful contributions to family, friends and society. That's one of the definitions of good mental health, right? And I think that is all possible, even in the setting of a genetic disease or even in the setting of some major trauma that might happen. All of this is achievable, good mental health with the right mindset, the right attitudes and sets of beliefs. So good mental health is how you feel, act, relate, make decisions and handle stress. All of that is changeable. It's fungible. It is not permanent and static. So right now, if you find you don't have the ability to relate well to others, that's fixable. If you find that you can't handle stress, that's fixable. How, if you feel bad all the time, that too is fixable. All of this is approachable in a stepwise fashion. Okay, so let's talk about how you can achieve this. So the first thing you have to do is have a healthy brain, right? You're not going to fix this overnight if your brain is filled with inflammation, if you don't have the right fuel source for your brain, if there's a bunch of oxidative stress and reactive oxygen species. I put this picture here because this is a beautiful electron micrograph of um, mitochondria. I mean, how cool is that? You can see the, the inner membranes, the outer membranes. You can just imagine all the energy production going on in that, that little organelle in a cell. It's pretty spectacular. <clears throat> but if your mitochondria and your brain aren't working well, you're never going to get a good mindset. You're never going to have good mental health. You're never going to have good physical health. OK, more and more information is coming out to show that um, neuroinflammation is a source of mo most of our neurodegenerative disorders. So your Parkinson's, your Alzheimer's, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of that depression and anxiety is related to the levels of uh, inflammation in your brain and in turn oxidative stress, which destroys cell membranes, destroys organelles and gives you poor mitochondria and you're not having enough energy production. The brain is just 2% of what you weigh. So if you weighed 100 pounds, 2 pounds is your brain, okay? But it's going to use 20% of all of your energy. And if you're working really hard on a project, it's going to use a little bit more, right? But the resting metabolism, just the fundamental basic functionality every day to day is 20% of your energy is being used by the brain. Your brain has to have healthy mitochondria. The mitochondria have to have a way to eliminate unnecessary reactive oxygen species and free radicals and to reduce inflammation or nothing's going to work well. And when you have critical networks in the brain that are depleted of energy because of poor mitochondrial function, guess what ends up happening? No motivation, anxiety, no self-esteem, no ability to have self-control, a bad mindset. And guess what that means? Bad health. And that's what I want to fix. To have good health, we got to have a good mindset. To have a good mindset, we got to have a healthy brain. And we're going to talk about all of that. Next slide, please. Thank you. All right. So 
As I've said, as you know, probably in your heart of hearts, mental health has a direct impact on physical health, okay? <clears throat> mental health has a direct impact on pain, on your outcomes from treatment, like I told you. In fact, most orthopedic literature, for instance, and this is in most literature in general in the medical world, if they decide to include things like, uh, does somebody have depression or anxiety? If that factor is even looked at in a study, most outcomes depend only, only, I'm serious about this, only on the psychological factors of the patient. That's it. Are they depressed? Are they anxious? Do they have poor mood? Uh, are they unmotivated, um, easily fatigable? Things like that matter more than anything else. Uh, in terms of outcomes from treatment. That's why I'm sharing this with you. I'm not sharing it with you to try to make anybody feel bad or to feel negative. I just want you to understand the power that you have over everything that happens to you. It, you should not want to put the power in somebody else's hand. And I'm trying to give that back to you. It has a direct impact on your longevity and on chronic disease, whether or not you have a chronic disease. And if you have a chronic disease, is it managed or not? Just so you know, if you think you have a mental health problem, you're not alone. At least 25%, one in four Americans has a diagnosed condition. What does that mean? Probably more are out there, not diagnosed. But one in four have a major depressive disorder or anxiety or something. So you are not alone. Um, but it's all addressable and your response to these conditions can be modified. And uh, the certain brain pathways are present that can be modified and used to your benefit. And we're going to talk about that. All right. There is a ton of crosstalk between your brain and your body. There's a lot of electrical communications and chemical communications. So from your brain to the fingertips, to the bottoms of your feet, you have massive networks of electrical conduits. Okay. We call them nerves. They're basically just electrical systems with different inputs and outputs and uh, electrons literally uh, travel up and down with what's called an action potential and the signal moves. That's one way your body communicates. The other way is chemical. So chemical messengers are sent all the time. Hormones, neurotransmitters, cytokines, cells run around depositing different proteins here and there as forms of communication. This is going on all the time between the brain, the body, between the body and the brain, between different parts of the body, okay? So once you understand that, then you understand how easily modifiable all of this is. There is no separation of brain and body like we used to think in philosophy, right? There's no Cartesian duality. I put this quote by Rene Descartes because he is one of the fathers of sort of this uh, ability to understand, I don't wanna say he's one of the fathers. He was in that group of philosophers that started thinking about this. Is the mind ephemeral and separate from the body, or is it part of the body? The body's here. It's matter. I can see it. I can touch it. I can't really touch your mind. I can't touch your mood. But we're starting to understand, because of this communication system, the electrical and the chemical, you really can touch it. We just haven't developed the instruments yet to really refine our capacity to do so. And I love this quote that he has. If you would be a real seeker after truth, it is necessary that at least once in your life, you doubt as far as possible all things. So one thing I've learned is the more I know, the more I don't know, if that makes any sense to you. So as you learn more, you realize how little you know about anything. And that's when you start to realize you should maybe doubt things and delve deeper and realize things. So what I see a lot in medicine is people just, just take things without a grain of salt and just fundamentally believe what the industry tells them without doubting it and without wondering why can't it be different? It can be different. I'm going to tell you that. We don't have to live the way we are right now in America. We can be healthier. And those are mitochondria talking to each other if you were wondering what that little picture was. Okay, the growth mindset. Let's get back to it. This is fundamental for good health, okay? Carol Dweck, I think it's Carol, she's from Stanford. She's one of the preeminent thinkers in the growth mindset world of psychology, but primarily in the field of education. Um, and she says that to have a good growth mindset, you will learn strategy, you will seek feedback when you are stuck, and you will try harder. In other words, you don't give up. That is a growth mindset. And a growth mindset has been linked to success in every single domain in life. What do I mean? Family domain, friend domain, work domain, sports domain, health domain, financial domain, 
everything is better if you have a growth mindset, particularly your health. Okay. And it is achievable by all. What we want is we don't want to say, I can't, we want to get rid of that. We always want to say, I can, we don't want learned helplessness. So what is learned helplessness and how does that play into a fixed mindset? So think about this. If you have a competitor, one of the best ways to get rid of competition is to make your competition feel like a victim. If you can convince your competition that they are a victim, that they have no internal locus of control, they have no agency, that all of their problems are caused by some nebulous outside force that is aligned against them, then you effectively own that person. Then they are now your victim. OK, that is learned helplessness. Learned helplessness is when you cannot find a resolution to a difficult issue, even if it's staring you in the face or touching you. It's right there in front of you. But inside of your heart of hearts, you so believe that you have no hope, that you have no ability to control anything, that even when it's right in front of you, you can't grab it and go. OK, this is one of the most famous cartoons about learned helplessness. And this shows you that a lot of these things start in childhood. Um, this little elephant is tacked to this thing and is stuck when it's a kid and says, that's as far as I can go. And then by the time it's grown up adult elephant, it still believes that even though obviously all it would have to do is take a step forward and would pull the chain and the stake out of the ground. Right. That's learned helplessness. Martin Seligman is the father of positive psychology. He developed the concept of learned helplessness back in the day with Stephen Meyer in 1967 with some shocking experiments they did with uh, animals. Um, and then he, after discovering or not discovering, but describing learn helplessness, went on to describe how you defeat or combat that with optimism and positivity. And then he developed this whole world of positive psychology, which I believe in. So learn helplessness and health. Let's say you're a smoker and you want to quit. You've tried drugs, you've tried cold turkey, you've tried counseling but you continue to fail and fail and fail, at some point, this smoker is going to say, nothing works. I'm going to stop trying. Nothing matters. So this smoker has developed apathy, all or none thinking, and they have no agency, no internal locus of control. In other words, a poor mindset. That's learned helplessness. And guess what? That smoker probably won't ever be able to quit. I don't want that for you. We can get out of that whole world. So let's talk about one example where there is a lot of research being done actually in orthopedics in terms of learned helplessness and psychological parameters as they relate to rehab and recovery. ACL surgery. Now, probably it's an ACL surgery because a lot of athletes, professional athletes, end up having the surgery. Uh, and professional athletes and the coaches and the owners of the teams and everybody involved in that world they understand the power of mindset and they understand enhanced recovery and things like that. So, so they're using these tools to make their lives better. And I just want it for you too. With ACL surgery, which is an anterior crucial ligament, that's when you tear the little uh, stabilizing ligament between the tibia and the femur that keeps your tibia from shifting forward on the femur. When you go in and reconstruct that, they've noticed a lot of people have a lot of trouble coming back from that surgery. And most of that is because of psychological deficits. Some of them um, is fear of re-injury. So a lot of these people just are scared of re-injuring themselves. And that obviously is going to slow down your recovery. There's this thing called kinesiophobia, which is the fear of movement. Why does that happen? Because they believe in, in their deepest soul that pain always means tissue damage, which it doesn't. And until you come out of that belief parameter, you will avoid pain all the time, right? So they, they have fear of moving their knee because they don't want to achieve a pain level because they think that's going to hurt them, even though movement is key to recovery, right? So kinesiophobia slows them down. And then catastrophic thinking about pain or pain catastrophizing. People that think catastrophically about pain, that it's always the worst pain ever, it's never gonna get better, it always means tissue damage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those are the ones that will not get better, that cannot recover. So in the world of ACL surgery, if those issues are managed, everybody does better. So what happens if they're not managed is you have depressed brain activity and muscle activity. So a lot of recovery in terms of muscle function and orthopedic things has to do with neural connections between the brain and the muscle, not so much the muscles themselves. So if you mess up that neural connection, that electrical and chemical crosstalk we talked about with these mindset problems, 
then you can't get that motor memory back. You can't, or muscle nerve memory, really. You can't get the muscle functioning properly. You can't get the balance and the sense of position and space and the performance back. So you have to combat these mindset issues to get the enhanced neural activity and the better recovery. And this has been shown in study after study. Once you manage these things, everybody, they achieve their recovery goals and they get back on the field of play. So there's some concrete examples from specific surgeries that are showing you that mindset really matters. Oh, there was an um, email issue with the talk going out and some people are just now joining us. So sorry if you missed the beginning, go ahead and share with anybody else. Obviously this is going to be recorded and available later. So you can watch the front end if you wish at a later time, but welcome. We're talking about the massive effect of mindset on health. So the first mental trick of gaining control of your mindset and controlling your brain's ability to modify pain, to modify different physiologic parameters of your health is to know yourself, to be self-aware. Until you know what your thought pattern is, what are you gonna fix? You have nothing to fix until you become aware of what's going on with your own mindset. Sun Tzu, who was a famous Chinese warrior, said before, know thyself, know thy enemy, a thousand battles, a thousand victories. So fundamentally, until you know yourself, and more importantly, until you know what's up against you in terms of the food industry, the medical industrial complex, the pharmacologic world, and then also the tech world and the entertainment world and how they're using your dopamine reward pathway systems against you, until you know yourself and your thought patterns and know your enemy and their thought patterns, you're never gonna achieve the victories that you should be achieving. So I put this picture, looks all healthy and happy, right? But what's he about to pick up? Orange juice. What is orange juice? 100% pure fructose, which is massively damaging to your health. But he doesn't know that he has been tricked by the food industry. You have to know yourself and you have to know what your enemy is thinking. <clears throat> you have been duped in life. I'm gonna give you one simple thing. Ice. How many doctors poo poo ice or people say, oh, I can't possibly help. There's no way, that's silly. I'm not going to ice it. I ha obviously, I need to have surgery. Simple things do matter. You've just been duped to be believing that it doesn't. So it enhances recovery. You've been told for years that nothing that you can do for yourself would matter. No, you got to take this pill. you got to have surgery. You need to do this imaging. Uh, no, none, none of that stuff you do at home is going to work. That's crazy. But look, ice reduces arterial blood flow to a region by 38% reduces soft tissue flow to an area of swelling by 26%, and then it reduces bone resorption by 19%. So what does that mean? You can actually help your bone stay strong, which guess what strong bone does? It helps brain-derived neurotropic factor be produced, which helps your brain, just by using simple things like ice when you sprain an ankle. So let's talk about that. Let's say you've sprained an ankle. So there's very little soft tissue covering in the ankle, right? It's mostly skin and bones. There's some vessels, some tendons, some ligaments. You tear the ligament, then what happens? The immune system comes in, there's inflammatory um, response. The vessels dilate, there's more blood flow, you have swelling. Well, normally you go see somebody, at the urgent care center, the physician's office or whatever, they'll immobilize you and tell you to stay off of it. Well, then you're fighting gravity and immobilization. And so the swelling gets worse. The neural connections between the brain and the ankle get diminished. You start to become scared of movement. You start to develop kinesiophobia. You get anxious about things. Well, the doctor told me I can't walk on it. The doctor told me I got to be in a boot and immobilize. And things just start to propagate and get worse. Just doing something as silly as putting ice on can help your mindset. It's amazing. You can reduce blood flow to the area. I already told you the stats on, with the studies, 38% arterial flow, I think it was 26% of soft tissue flow. You can lower the release of histamine and other irritating cytokines, which are what? Those chemical messengers that I told you about, chemical and electrical messengers. You can reduce the exudate or the fluid 
um, expansion in the area. You could strict the blood vessels so there's less of that swelling. You can slow the conduction of the pain fibers, the C fibers, which means that your brain doesn't get the same number of nociceptive inputs. And then you reduce mus muscle tension. So you can, just by putting ice on an ankle sprain, reduce the incidence of kinesiophobia, catastrophic thinking about pain, things like that. So there's simple tricks we can use to help our mindset. And this has been shown to even help reduce infection rates if done preoperatively. I put this picture on here. This is an uh, Iceman machine. I think there's different brand names and different companies, but this is an ice compression device. When I was in the military, I was able to give this to every single person. They were amazing and awesome and dramatically reduced use of any sort of pain um, pills and things like that and helped enhance recovery. It's safe. It's easy. Problem is conventional group insurance now and Medicare do not cover this. So it's unfortunate um, because I think a lot of problems would be solved with silly things like ice. What if we could just do that for people? Wouldn't that be great? And I just want you to know that it's not all um, just sitting there trying to do yoga and meditate and control your mindset. There's simple physical tricks you can do to make your mindset better with any given health condition. So by limiting the kinesiophobia or the fear of movement, by putting the ice on, which reduces the swelling and the pain, you can then get rid of that irrational and excessive fear of movement that is slowing down your recovery. So pain that is persistent with activity can induce kinesiophobia. So if you can modify the pain signals with something as silly as ice and maybe compression, then you're going to help your recovery. More importantly, you can't believe that pain always equals tissue damage. Pain happens with or without tissue damage. That is a technical definition of pain. All pain is, is a brain derived perception of danger for any given nociceptive electrical signal input. What is nociception? Uh, nociceptors are the receptors that respond to things like stretch, compression, tearing, heat, uh, cold. So those are the noxious stimuli input cells that send an electric signal to your brain, then your brain decides if that's painful or not, because your brain decides how dangerous that signal really is. What is that really going to do to me as a fundamental organism on this earth? Is it going to decrease my chances for survival or increase them? So that's totally controllable how you interpret the nociceptive input. So you can't fundamentally believe that all nociceptive inputs indicate tissue damage because they just don't. Avoiding movement generally makes any given problem worse. And I know when I was in training, and I've seen it even still, unfortunately, um, in my medical community, a lot of physicians tell people, well, stop doing that. Well, don't do it. Don't, don't, don't exercise. No, you can't do that. You can't move mostly probably because they're scared of being sued if the patient does have pain or something later. But no literature supports zero immobilization for almost any given problem. Most injuries, most pain respond well to functional recovery. Functional recovery means you're functioning, you're moving. Movement helps your body. You have to move to keep your brain healthy. You have to move to keep your body healthy. So avoiding movement usually makes a problem worse. Why do people avoid movement? Because they're scared of the pain. Why are they scared of the pain? Because they think the pain means something bad all the time. These are the things we have to change in terms of mindset. So there's a fear avoidance model that induces actual brain changes that make pain worse and make you move less and reduce the neural connections between your brain and your muscle. And that leads to chronic pain and dysfunction. So I don't want you to fall into that trap. So if it's just something as simple as putting ice on after an X-Prain, do it because it's going to help you in your long-term enhanced recovery. When I have patients with ankle sprains, the first thing I do is put them in physical therapy. I try to get them in physical therapy within a week. Why? Because the studies show that those people do better six months out than the ones that are immobilized right away. So learn helplessness can be unlearned. If you think that you're in that group of people that has that sort of sense of being a victim all the time and learned helplessness, just know that you can unlearn this. There's an entire industry of consultants teaching the military this, teaching CEOs of Fortune 500 companies this, uh, politicians, CIA agents, whatever. They are taking this seriously and learning how to get out of that learned helplessness world. So can you. Dr. Seligman himself promoted the idea of optimism. And remember, he's the one that sort of described learned helplessness to the world. 
He wants you to explain events in a constructive manner, as do I. Develop a positive internal dialogue, like how you talk to yourself about what's going on in the world and to engage in what? A growth mindset. So I think just by gaining agency or a sense of self-control over what's going on to you and how you're responding to what's going on to you, a lot of what we do in medicine can be improved. Um, so you need to have a locus of control internally that you're not a victim, that you are controlling events. And then that gives you self-actualization and efficacy, meaning that any given treatment will work better. And then again, you're not going to get out of this box until you know how you are thinking about things, until you understand your internal dialogue, how you are thinking about things. Know thyself, know thy enemy, a thousand battles, a thousand victories. Then he went on to say, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. So as long as you gain self-awareness, I think that you're almost there. So you just have to start to really think about how do I think about things? And then if you find that you respond to things negatively, that you think about pain catastrophically, et cetera, et cetera, you can work on changing it. Oh, Melinda said something very nice. Thank you, Melinda. She said, uh, this is so good. You're teaching people how to live. Well, I hope so. Unfortunately, I see this every day, all day in my clinic, in my practice of medicine. And it just, it actually makes me very sad because I know people could be so much healthier if they would just gain a growth mindset. All right. So you're probably thinking some of you out there, this can't be true. She's crazy. Well, I'm here to tell you the science supports what I'm telling you. Neuroplasticity is real. The brain can change. We used to think it couldn't, uh, but that was before some more advanced functional MRI techniques and different ways to sense what the brain is doing with measurement and seeing where the receptors are opening and closing, where the neurotransmitters are going. Now that our tools are better, we understand things a lot better. Think about medicine before the advent of the microscope. A lot of people thought a lot of certain things like that, you know, humors, fire and water was why people got sick. Then we realized, mm, no, it's bacteria. So once the tools and the technology get to certain points, we learn more. Now we know the brain can change. OK, people knew this, I think, in the spiritual world and philosophical world before, but nobody knew how. And now we know how or we're starting to know how we really don't know anything again. Of course, we learn more and more every day. The body of knowledge doubles every hour now, I think. It's kind of scary. But anyway, serotonin neurons in the dorsal raphae nucleus of your brain have been proven to be involved in learned helplessness. So this is uh, in animal studies. So they have poor escape responding. So they don't find ways to escape noxious stimuli like shock or heat. They have exaggerated conditioned fear. And all of this is from acute stress exposure, right? So that something is done to them that's painful or annoying. Um, and then the serotonin neurons get hyperactive in this particular section of the brain. And then they have this exaggerated conditioned fear response there going forward because those pathways have been cemented in the brain, but they can be uncemented and changed. We think this is because of the serotonin, which is 5-HT receptor neuroplasticity. So they're hyperactive with uncontrolled stress and there's desensitized inhibition. So remember I told you your brain can inhibit or facilitate amplify or inhibit things. So when you have less inhibition from the 5-HT type 1A receptor, then you have hyperactivity 5-HT receptors and you get this exaggerated condition fear. So learn helplessness has a true pathway with real receptors and real neurotransmitters that act in a certain way and it can be modified and changed. Okay. But in order for you to change those pathways and to have control, you got to have a healthy brain. Okay. So you got to get your brain healthy before you can really work on your mindset. Well, but on the other hand, you got to work on your mindset to get your brain healthy. So personally, I'm a big advocate of an entire paradigm change or life change, like start being a little bit healthy and start working on your mindset a little bit. And, and then it's going to grow with each other. But you can't just do one and do not do the other. So in other words, you can't keep eating ultra processed foods, not sleeping, uh, getting stressed out all the time, and then think you're going to change from a negative to a positive mindset. You kind of have to fix both sides here. So BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor, uh, vascular endothelial growth factor, insulin growth factor, 
reduced inflammation, reduced oxidative stress, better sleep, all of that is important for a healthy brain. All of that is achievable with diet, circadian rhythm, better sleep, reducing mental stress, and having the right micronutrients on board. And then it's easier to control your mindset. You can grow new neurons. It is possible. For years, we've been told it wasn't. And you certainly can form new synapses and new connections, and you can change those pathways. You can increase the facilitation when you need to increase it. You can decrease the inhibition and vice versa. Different branches of the nerves can be pruned back and then remodeled. You know, if, you, if you're a gardener, you know pruning things is important to get healthy growth. So same thing in the brain. If you have a dysfunctional and useless connection that is not helping you, it needs to be pruned back. And all of this is possible with a good mindset and with the right tools to let that mindset fix your brain, meaning you need to have all of these molecules and you can't have too much inflammation and you certainly can't have too much oxidative stress. So BDNF is hugely important and you can increase your levels of BDNF for your brain health by exercising. Okay, any, any kind of resistance or aerobic, it doesn't matter. As long as you do movement, your levels of BDNF goes up, which means you have a healthier brain. So this is why people that have good healthy bone, which indicates a lifetime of good exercise and resistance exercise, generally have a lower incidence of dementia and other neurodegenerative problems later in life because of this chemical crosstalk between the body and the brain. So what makes or breaks a brain? What, how can you get a healthy brain? So here's your adaptive list and your maladaptive list. Exercise is probably the most fundamentally important thing you can do for yourself. You have to move in some way, shape, or form every day. Resistance exercise, aerobic, probably doesn't matter. It's been shown both ways to help, uh, but do something. Uh, and then environmental enrichment. You can't just sit and watch the same TV show every day and never read a book and never learn something or never expose yourself to a new environment or a new conversation. You have to have environmental enrichment to have a healthy brain. You have to learn. So continually try to learn. Um, personally, I try to read all the time and learn as much as I can about everything. Good nutrition is obviously fundamentally important to good brain health. And then good sleep. I can't emphasize sleep enough. The first thing I do when people come to me and tell me they hurt or they have a problem is ask about their sleep. Because I know without good sleep, I might as well just leave my clinic because whatever I'm going to do isn't going to matter. You have to have good sleep. Maladaptive is chronic stress. So always being under chronic mental stress and not having a good way to cope with it and handle it. Depression is maladaptive. Pain catastrophizing, kinesiophobia, having significant illness, having poor nutrition and poor sleep. All of that is not going to help your brain. You're going to have poorly functioning mitochondria. Remember, we talked about the mitochondria before. Your crosstalk is going to be all messed up. You're going to have good pathways diminished and bad pathways enhanced. So the first thing you can do for yourself is move more, eat better, sleep better, and then you can start working on your mindset. So here's an example of neuroplasticity. There was a study of London taxi drivers. So they have a three to four year training period where they learn the roads and everything. And then they take a very stringent test after that. And after that three to four year period, they actually measured the gray matter in the brains of these taxi drivers before and after that time period. And they had grown their gray matter. So they had made their brains better and bigger just because of this learning period. And then the mental needs for this test that they had to take. And then the same study has been done looking at people with stressful life events over even just a short three month period. And they found that these people had diminished brain size and diminished gray matter. So the brain can obviously change depending on what you give the brain or how you treat the brain. So if you're going to give it just stress and no learning and no movement, you might not have the brain that you want. If you're going to give the brain movement, activity, enrichment, sleep, nutrients, and a good attitude, you're probably going to have the brain you want, I would guess, based on what I've seen in the literature. <clears throat> Here's another little study that's kind of interesting. The control group in the white shows you sort of the brain pathways. And then there's one with chronic mental stress, which so shows you how it gets diminished and smaller. So the things, the, the way the brain talks to itself is not working right. Then they took the people with chronic mild stress and gave them an antidepressant, which does what? It changes the levels of serotonin and other neurotransmitters in the brain. And they found that 
the dendritic pathways or the connections between the neurons and the cells grew back again. So there is neuroplasticity that's possible. I'm sure the pharmacologic world wants you to think it's only possible with antidepressants, but the same thing has been shown with exercise and good sleep and good, healthy nutrition. So I'm just showing you that the brain can change. It is possible. And anybody that tells you that it can't is wrong. It can be changed for your betterment. It does not have to be changed in a bad way. So the brain will allocate resources. Um, you've probably heard that Deaf people gain more visual acuity, blind people hear better and feel better so they can read braille, things like that. So the brain will transfer resources based on what is needed and necessary. Um, and it's pretty magical. <clears throat> so likewise, the brain can be trained to either believe things are terrible and negative and nothing's gonna get better, or the brain can be trained to believe that there is a possibility in the future that you do have control to make things better, that you can make things better, and that you will do it. So you can train yourself out of learned helplessness. Like I said, it probably won't happen overnight. It is 100% possible, and that's been shown in many studies. You have to reverse the negative conditioning of what's happened to us in America over time. We've been told that, oh, we're all just going to be obese and have diabetes. Oh, there's no way we're not going to have neurodegenerative disorders, and we need to throw tons of money at Alzheimer's research. And, oh... It is what it is. Stress is where it is. Oh, the foods don't do anything to you. Oh, just here's a cell phone. Just do some likes and flip some screens and everything will be better and you'll feel better. You'll get that nice little dopamine hit and be happy. You got to reverse this negative conditioning that's been foisted upon you. Know your enemy and know yourself. First, become aware if you do have negative thoughts about everything and how you respond to things. Without that awareness, you're not going to be able to fix anything. And look, all of us have this problem. It's not just, I'm not saying you, I mean, I have to deal with this all the time too. I get stressed out every single day, obviously. So become aware of your negative thoughts and then try to modify them. Become aware if you have an internal or an external locus of control. Become aware if you believe traits and features are stable and will never change, or if you believe that they're temporary and changeable or fungible. Become aware if you have a global way of thinking about things or specificity. And we're gonna talk about all of that. And then I put this picture here because without muscle and movement, your brain's going nowhere. I just want to keep emphasizing that. <clears throat> Excuse me. So awareness of thought patterns, internal, external locus of control. What do I, what do I mean? Well, I see this a lot as well, as does most, any physician probably. There's the patients that come in that say, no doctor understands me and I'm never going to get better. That person has an external locus of control. They really fundamentally believe that they're victims, that everything is the fault of somebody else, that the world is out to get them. Nobody, you know, they don't have agency. Then there's the patients that come in and say, I just don't seem to be able to respond to any of the treatment recommendations. Well, I feel like I'm just not doing something right, blah, blah, blah. Those people have more of an internal locus control or self agency. So become aware of how you think about things. Okay. And then stable or permanent. I've been overweight my whole life. It's just, it's not going to change. That is a stable thought pattern, right? Not really conducive to a good mindset or health. Or you can say, you know, I kind of remember always being heavy my whole life, but I'm pretty sure that can change. That is temporary or a non-stable way of thinking about things. That's going to help you more. So again, know thyself. Just start to think about how you're thinking about things. Once you become aware of your particular thought patterns, then you can move on from that and try to find what's going to work for you to get healthier. So global or specific, you know, diabetes runs in my family. So it doesn't matter what I eat or if I lose weight, I'm still going to get diabetes. That's a pretty global way of thinking about things. You know, many people in my family have diabetes, but I also notice that they seem to only eat ultra processed foods. So I think I can change. I don't think I have to be diabetic. That's specific and not a global thought pattern. That is a person that has an optimism for the future and knows they can change. So this is what we're trying to get you to start thinking like. Without that good growth mindset, you will not have a health mindset, which means you cannot be healthy. That's just what the literature says. Optimism matters probably more than anything. 75% of success in any given life domain is predicted by optimism. 25% of success is depicted by, uh, predicted by IQ. Think about that. If you're optimistic and work hard and have a growth mindset, 
your odds of being successful in any given parameter of your life are far greater than if you're just simply smart or have a good IQ, whatever that means. Um, so the same incident, an optimist will think about differently than a pessimist. So here, this is a good example, has a good experience, has a bad experience. So let's think about this as you kick the winning goal in a soccer game or you don't. So an optimist, if they don't kick the winning goal, will say, that's not like me. It's just normally I do a good job. It just it was a fluke that day. I'm going to do better next time. If they did kick the good goal or they had a good experience, then they believe an optimist believes that's totally what I do. I am the ringer. I am such a good soccer player. I'm always going to kick the winning goal. And they, so good things they tend to internalize and believe in self agency that they did it. Bad things they figure out you know, something happened that changed that outcome, but that's not fundamentally who I am. The pessimist is the exact opposite. If something good happens, they believe that was the fluke and that usually things are going to go terrible. And, you know, it was an accident. I kicked the winning goal. It bounced off the goalie um, versus the other way. If they miss the goal, they think that that is really just sort of that's how they are. They're just a terrible soccer player. It's never going to change. So you see the same event just thought about differently can change everything. And you just need to understand how you think about it and then change how you think about it. And guess what? Once you start starting to think a little bit more positively and a word of advice here, don't try to eliminate the negative thoughts. Just try to add positive thoughts. That works far better than trying to eliminate the negative thoughts. As you add more positive thinking, the negative stuff just goes away. If you try to just focus on the negative and get rid of it, it's never going to happen. There's a study that went out two decades that showed that more happiness and optimism is linked to being better in terms of health. Uh, the stroke risk in, in this study, they looked at stroke risk, sorry, in particular, and the risk was reduced two to 5%. And that was independent of the age of the person, the socio-democratic uh, demographic factors. In other words, uh, were they in poverty or not? Did they live in the inner city or not, et cetera, et cetera. Independent of age, socio-demographic, and depression factors. So just having a positive mindset reduced your stroke risk. Think about that. That's better than most drugs, and you don't have to pay for it. Healthier lifestyles lead to future happiness and optimism. And guess what? Happiness and optimism lead to healthier lifestyles. You're going to have to work on both of them together, sadly. You can't just pick and choose here. Okay, optimism, positive affect, and pain. How does that work? Remember, pain is simply the brain's perception of the incoming electrical and chemical signals. The brain is going to decide this is a true danger signal or not, and there are inhibitory pathways and facilitatory pathways. So you can either amplify the signal or you can depress the signal. It is not the same as the signal itself. It is an interpretation of the signal. That's what you have to understand. The whole Cartesian model of thinking, which is the biomedical approach to medicine, is that the pain is independent. It's an independent feature that never changes. If you have a rotator cuff tear, that will hurt. Your brain will tell you it hurts and nothing changes. That's fundamentally 100% not true, I'm here to tell you. It is subjective. Any given signal can be amplified or eliminated, facilitated or not. So descending inhibition is top-down control of the incoming electrical signals. Okay, so what happens is a receptor, the nociceptor, so the mechanical receptor, the heat receptor, the cold receptor, the tearing receptor, the chemical receptor, whatever, whatever receptor gets irritated, is gonna send a signal through the electrical conduit system to the periaqueductal gray area of your brain, which is part of the gray matter, and then it'll travel on the spino, I can never say these words, spino mesencephalic tract, okay? And then it'll go to the rostral ventral medulla. So there's all different areas of the brain involved, which means what? Different neurons, different receptors, different densities of receptors, different neurotransmitters, uh, which comes back down to nutrition and micronutrients. If it's going through from the periaqueductal gray to the rostral ventral medulla, if it has to pass through a massive amount of inflammation and oxidative stress, that's going to mess things up. Then the rostral ventral medulla will send a signal to the cord, which then will engage the endogenous opiate system. So 
you could see there's a lot that goes into what you think of as pain per se. The old industrial medical complex view or the Cartesian view, mind, body, duality, the separation of mind and body says that pain is hardwired. Noxious inputs are always passively sent to the brain and they are what they are and we need to fix that input. Uh, I see that spot on your MRI and that is why you hurt and I will fix that spot and you will be better. That is the old way of thinking about things. Pain can happen without tissue damage, remember? Pain is a subjective experience that has nothing to do usually with tissue damage or any level of tissue damage. And it can be completely modified because of the complexity of the electroconduit and hormonal neurotransmitter systems. So I know it's a lot to take in, but I just want you to understand there is a scientific basis for why mindset works and why optimism works. So your brain decides how you feel. The variables that modify, that either amplify or diminish the pain signal, and I'm talking about pain mostly because that's sort of what we all think of when we think of disease and orthopedic problems and injury. Your emotions matter, the environment you're in matters, the mood matters, how much sleep you had matters, what you ate that day or what you eat generally matters, your expectations of pain matter, and the attention you give the pain matter. Expectations is something pretty interesting. We'll talk about it a little bit later. Um, but what you think that you're supposed to feel matters. So again, all of this goes into your experience of pain. So clearly all of that is changeable, right? All that goes back to mindset. We need a growth and a health mindset. Your brain takes every variable into account and produces a perception. It is so complex, it's not even imaginable. So facilitation versus inhibition. You're either gonna amplify and make everything worse or you're gonna calm it down and bring it back. The nociceptor's action potential, remember the little receptor that picks up, let's say you put your finger in a candle flame. So the heat sensor and the tissue sensor that's sensing tissue damage is going to send an action potential, which means that electrons are going to propagate from the fingertip to the brain, and they're going to go to the spinothalamic tract, and there's either going to be facilitation of that signal or inhibition of the signal. And that depends on the level of danger. So for instance, let's think of an incidence where like you closed your finger in a car door. So, but something else was going on and you, you had to think about something else, like a kid was going to run into the street. You don't even think about your finger. You don't even feel the pain until that other thing that takes primary importance and attention is managed. Then you might realize your finger hurts. Why don't you feel the pain right away? Because your brain senses that that's not as dangerous as this right now. Therefore, I am not going to feel that pain. Well, if your brain has that power, then it has that power all the time. You just have to learn how to sort of harness that power. And this comes down to the chemical messengers and electrical messengers, the serotonin, the norepinephrine, the acetylcholine, all of the endogenous opioids, all of the endogenous cannabinoids. All of these can be trained. It's changeable. It is not permanent. Remember I told you the ACL studies where they show kinesiophobia and pain catastrophizing? Catastrophic thinking about pain is one of the ways we can tell if someone's going to do terribly after a surgery. There's actually surveys you can do, tests you could take or give to people to see if they're pain catastrophizers or not. If they are, you can pretty much guarantee you're going to have a bad outcome. Now, you may still do the surgery because you feel obligated to do it or you feel like it might help them. But generally speaking, if someone has catastrophic thinking about pain, they're not going to do well. And we know that. And that's an external locus of control and the deep fundamental belief that pain is always tissue damage and, you know, that nothing good could come of anything and the belief that things are permanent and there's a hyper focus on pain itself. So part of a good, healthy growth mindset is to stop thinking catastrophically about pain and disease. One study showed that just writing, just the activity of writing down what your best self would be doing today, diminished pain in a controlled study. So one group wrote, they had that activity of writing something positive, another group did not, the same noxious input was given, and the group that wrote something positive felt less pain. Simply focusing on positive things helps more than anything. I mean, it's that simple. So how does an optimist think about things? So let's say they, you gave a talk, like let's say um, you were speaking in front of a room filled with 100 people, and 
you messed up, you forgot your lines, the slides didn't work, whatever, you tripped on the stage, God forbid. Uh, an optimist would say, you know, I didn't get a lot of sleep last night and uh, that's why I did poorly. Normally I give a great talk and I'm awesome. Or the pessimist would say, I never do well in public speaking. The audience is always distracting and there was stuff on the stage and, and the lights were wrong and it's totally not my fault. But, but really I'm bad at public speaking anyway. That is not what you wanna think about in life. Now I'm gonna bring it to food and nutrition, okay? The optimist will say, you know, it's a fluke that I ate that donut. They are my weakness and they're delicious, but I'm gonna do better next time. The pessimist will say, I have no ability to avoid the temptation of donuts, why bother? So you can either have an internal locus control over how you go about your health and your life and your diet and your nutrition and your sleep, and you can believe that things can change, or you don't have to think that way at all. And you just keep going on the way you're going and always eat the donuts, right? And never get a good night's sleep. Winston Churchill said, a pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity, but the optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty. So rather than seeing things as obstacles to stop progress, you need to see things as a challenge that, oh, this is gonna make me do better. And wow, if I figure out how to handle this, I'm gonna be able to handle that. So you got to start thinking about things differently because guess what? There's going to be roadblocks everywhere. What happens is how you handle that roadblock, how you handle that obstacle. So with an optimism and a growth mindset, you will feed a health and a healthy mindset. And then with good health, you're going to feed the healthy mindset and the optimism and the growth mindset. All of this is linked. Again, you have to have a synergistic strategy. You have to have a way to get things better all at once. I'm going to tell you the supplements that are going to help your brain health, nutrition, things like that. You already know exercise will help your brain health. You already know sleep will help your brain health. You start doing those different little pieces in your life and then become self-aware of how you think about things. And then you're going to start to see changes. But it, you kind of have to synergize and do all of this together. It's a, it's a circle. Let's talk about diets. 95% of diets fail. Okay. That's not really a good statistic. 10 to 80% of participants in any given diet, um, app, group, whatever program you join, 10 to 80% of participants drop out. 1992, the National Institutes of Health put out a panel consensus opinion that said almost all weight loss is regained after whatever particular diet you're on after about five years. A 2007 review <clears throat> showed that diet cycling or the, you know, the up and down and up and down and up and down is harmful in and of itself and should be avoided. And that no weight loss program at that time had any good evidence to support it being successful. A 2015 review said the odds of making it to normal weight if your BMI class is one, which is a BMI of 30 to 35, was one in 124. If your BMI is over 40, your odds are one in a 677 of ever getting to a normal weight per this 2015 review. So should we give up? Should Americans just say, forget about it? 40 to 50% of us are going to be obese. 90% of us are going to have terrible metabolic health. 50% of us are going to be insulin resistant or more. It is what it is. Nothing's going to change. I mean, look at the statistics. If you have a fixed mindset, you're going to agree with that. You should give up. Why bother? It is what it is. We're all just going to be diabetic. They just need to come up with better injectable weight loss drugs, right? But if you have a growth mindset, you're going to say, no, Obviously, we're thinking about things wrong and something's not computing here. And we need to back up and figure out why these diets are failing. And then we need to work around it, turn that obstacle into a challenge and fix things. And we are going to figure it out and we are going to get better. That's where I am with this. This is fixable, these terrible stats. But you have to have awareness of thyself and thy enemy. All these stats are terrible because they're using mindset against you. And they're using the dopamine reward system against you with ultra processed foods and sugar addiction. Okay. Once you become aware of what your enemy is doing, you can fix things. It's all thought processes. Okay. So one of the problems with diets is it basically most diet programs put you in a fixed mindset. They give you a certain goal. You must learn this. You must lose this percent of your body weight or these pounds, right? So you're not really focused on what really matters, which is health and wellness and good brain health and proper micronutrients and good sleep 
good circadian rhythm? No, what you're focused on is a certain set pound number. And then that puts you into this fixed mindset. And then there's this whole school of thought out there that says weight is genetic. It's not your problem. You're a victim. You're never going to be able to change it. But oh, by the way, here's a drug you can take. Okay. Now, for you to believe weight is genetic would mean that you have to believe that the fundamental human genome has the capacity to change overnight and really in the blink of an eye in the terms of human evolution. Because obesity to the level we've seen has only been around for what, 100 years, probably less. Um, and the genome hasn't really changed that much. So I personally don't think there's just some gene that got turned on and off that made Americans fat all of a sudden. Um, so that again, puts you into a fixed mindset if you do believe that. Because if you believe that, then that puts you in that external locus of control that I can't possibly change anything. And then there's the whole stable thought pattern. Oh, I've been heavy my whole life. I can't possibly change. Uh, I'll go on this diet and I'll try to lose 5% of my body weight. But I mean, really, I've been this way my whole life, doc. That's not going to work either. And then guess what? When you have a certain number of pounds you're supposed to lose, you've been told it's genetic and you believe that it's a stable trait that's never going to change, then every meal becomes an anxiety prone event. Then every meal becomes stressful. And then what does that do? Increases your cortisol levels, your chronic mental stress, messes with your mindset more. So the real problem with diets is how we've been approaching them in general. I personally don't care if a patient is heavy or not heavy. What I care about is their health. Now, obesity is generally a marker of poor health. So once you fix your health, usually the weight follows. So once you start eating well, sleeping well, exercising more, doing more, thinking better, being more positive, usually the weight goes away, the excess weight, the excess energy storage that you don't need. Um, so I think our focus and our approach has been wrong. So I don't want people to give up and get a fixed mindset just because of the stats I showed you of the epic failure of the dieting world. Rather, we need to just get a better growth mindset and health mindset and think about things differently. So you need to generate a new way of doing things. You need to learn from your mistakes. Your mistakes are not failures. They're just opportunities for improvement. Without making mistakes, how do you ever get better? None of us were born experts, right? You have to make mistakes to learn. And just because all diets fail, that doesn't really mean anything. We used to put leeches on people and suck blood out of them and thought that was going to make them better, right? Like just because of how we've been doing diets in America hasn't worked doesn't mean that it can't, that people can't get healthy. They can get healthy, but we just need to start thinking about things differently. So again, by definition, it's going to put you in a fixed mindset mentality. It gives you a big goal. You have performance metrics. You're going to compare yourself to others. God forbid you go on any of these apps that show you before and after pictures, which are all enhanced. And now they're probably enhanced by AI. Uh, so the comparison thing just increases your mental stress. And there's no overall thought of the importance of food and the importance of micronutrients and why you need to reduce inflammation in your brain and oxidative stress and why you need to reduce the advanced glycation end products that are destroying your cartilage and your tendons and your ligaments and your bones. When you start thinking about what food is actually doing to you in terms of uh, inflammation, oxidative stress, advanced glycation end products, that's when you're going to start to eat healthier, get the right micronutrients in and keep the bad chemicals out. And then guess what? Weight will follow. Rather than giving yourself a fixed percentage of I'm going to lose five pounds uh, and I'm going to eat 15% carbs and 40% protein and 30% fats. I mean, obviously none of that's worked ever. What you really should focus on is I'm going to make my brain healthy and I'm not going to put ultra processed chemical foods in me because I know it's going to do X, Y, and Z to me. Rather, I'm going to eat this because I know it's going to help my brain. I'm going to eat this because I know it's going to help my muscle. You know, start being more positive and take positive, proactive steps to reduce inflammation and oxidative stress. And guess what? The weight's going to follow. So you have to have just a healthy growth mindset. Don't disengage and give up. This is just one example of one aspect of health. Self-affirm yourself. So praise for your effort and not your ability. So, gosh, I worked really hard. And you know what? I did not eat that donut today that that rep brought to the office to give to my staff to try to convince me to do something. And I'm proud of myself. Rather than beating yourself up every time you do eat a donut, you just got to make baby steps, right? Become aware of your thoughts about food. Accept your thoughts, your true thoughts and your feelings, and then just modify them gradually. You need to understand that donuts, like much of ultra processed foods, are unnatural combinations of sugar and fat put together 
in an engineered way that are meant to induce the addictive pathways in your brain that are meant to give you a sense of reward and fulfillment. They're trying to engage your dopamine to get you addicted to that hook. Just understand that. I mean, you're human. I'm human. Who doesn't love a donut, right? We all love them. They're engineered to be loved. But once you become aware of what is happening to you, once you know what the enemy is doing to you, it gives you the fuel and the tools to not do it, to fight back. Every time you eat that donut, enjoy it, enjoy how it tastes, but also think about all of the molecular destruction that is happening in your body with each bite. And then if you engage in a bit of self-control daily, little ways, you're going to gain more and more. It's like a muscle. And then you're going to one day not even want the donut, I promise. So this is an inevitable evolution. Once you believe that the brain is capable of change, which I think I've shown you that, once you understand the pathways, which more and more is being learned all the time, and again, we'll just redo these talks as more knowledge comes out. Once you know that your mindset can change, which means your health can change, then it's not just possible, it is inevitable. So you're going to go from loving donuts to not loving donuts to being this guy. And I love this little meme. It says, this is what happens when you get word on which coworker has been eating your organic honey from the office fridge. That's when you're going to be the person that's bringing the organic fruits and vegetables because that's what you love because that they make you feel good now. And you know that the false pleasure you got from the ultra processed food was actually inducing inflammation and abnormal dopamine reward systems in your brain. You've seen through the enemy and you have broken out on the other side. And that's where we're all gonna be. It's inevitable once you understand. So remember I told you we would talk about expectations and pain? So expectations shape pain 100%. Um, I'm going to give you one example. They've done studies where they give a noxious stimuli. So like, let's say a shock and <clears throat> the intensity of the shock will change as a color changes in the room. So the bigger shock that hurts more is associated with red color and the lower shock that doesn't really hurt is associated with blue. We'll say, well, if you take those people that have been conditioned and have this, um, this signal that is matched to a certain expectation of pain, and then you, give them just the color, like let's say you give them a red color, but with the very low shock that doesn't cause pain, they will feel pain. Conversely, if you give them the high shock, but you give them the blue color, they don't feel the pain or they feel very little pain. That's been shown in multiple studies, multiple preclinical and human studies. And that's just one example. So your expectations shape pain. They also shape your success and health. So remember, while you eat that delicious donut, just think about every molecule of the used grease that was used over and over and over again to fry it. Think about the refined, highly processed flour that came spitting out of a factory's backside. Think about all of the sad workers on minimum wage and terrible conditions that are making this donut for you and then enjoy it. Because you know what? It does taste good. But then think about that awesome apple that you're gonna have later that's really gonna be good for your body and also tastes really good. Another trick a lot of people, uh, uh, coaches for mindset will tell you to do is if you see that donut in the waiting room at three and you are so tempted and you have no self-control or ability to say no to it, then you tell yourself, if I eat this donut, then I'm gonna eat a donut every single day at three o'clock until I die. And once you realize that that is the punishment or the reward, so to speak, for eating that donut, you're probably not gonna want it anymore because who wants to eat a disgusting donut every day at three o'clock for the rest of their life? So there's different little tricks you can do to change your expectations of any given particular temptation. So again, don't focus on your negative thoughts, be aware of your negative thoughts, but instead of beating yourself up for eating crappy food all day long, Pat yourself on the back because you ate edamame today. Or, you know what? I had some steamed broccoli and I feel really good about that. Now, you may have had six bags of potato chips too, but maybe that's the first day you actually ate something with an actual micronutrient that will actually help your brain. You need to be positive and be happy about that and focus on that. And when you do, I bet you're going to end up eating more of those and less of the chips, okay? Think about the health benefits as you're eating, as you're preparing your food, as you go shopping think, you know, this food with 
ingredients. I don't even know how to pronounce on the back. It's in a plastic bag. This is nothing I would ever find on a tree or a plant anywhere. This is going to destroy me if I buy it and eat it. Don't buy it. Start thinking that way when you're shopping. Accept that you will always love and enjoy healthy and profitable foods, at least when you initially take it in, because they're engineered to be loved and enjoyed. They're engineered to trick your brain. Okay. Just be aware of it. Just know yourself. Focus on the positive. The negativity will go away. Have some smart goals. I put Heather Miller here, or sorry, Shannon Miller, not Heather Miller, the Olympic champion who then went on and got ovarian cancer. And then after that developed a company where she helps with health, uh, particularly for women, I think, and children. Um, Obviously, she's a goal setter, very small goals. I put this on here because she told a story on a podcast I heard once where she was about to quit, and I might be getting this wrong, but she was going to quit at one point, and this was before she became the champion that she really is, uh, but a coach at the time told her to sit down and write her goals, the like five-year goals, and then write how she was going to achieve the five-year goal and how she was going to achieve the one-year goal and what was she going to do today and what was she going to do next week. When she wrote down the goals, then he said, just come in and, and do that one first step. She had smart, measurable, achievable, relevant, and timely goals, and then eventually got back, got her growth mindset back, and went on to become a champion. And now she's you know, changing the world for the better. So, so don't beat yourself up. Give yourself small achievable goals with changing to a growth mindset and getting out of this negative uh, medical industrial complex way of thinking and this terrible food industry destruction of your brain. Um, but don't think you're going to do it every overnight. And don't beat yourself up. If you make a mistake and eat some bad food, we all do it. Just try to eat more good food and then be happy about that. So use psychology to get your mind right. The commitment principle, okay? This is a sales technique. There's a great book called Influence that goes through multiple different ways of uh, using psychological tricks to persuade people. One of them is called the commitment principle. Write it down. Write down your goals. Write down positive thoughts about yourself. Write on a piece of paper, I am a healthy person and I am awesome. And you know what? The act of writing fundamentally commits you to being consistent to that. This was used against prisoner of war by the Chinese during the Korean War. What they did was they got American prisoners in the Korean War, okay, to write down uh, essays. They would have them do essays rather than torture them. And they were using the commitment principle and psychological persuasion principles. They would write essays and they would have to say something negative about America and something positive about communism. And over time, they used the principle of commitment, the act of writing that made that particular soldier feel that way about himself. And then he committed to that and became consistent with that principle. Right now, you probably are committed and consistent with the American viewpoint of health. It is what it is. Uh, you know, I have an MRI tear. That's why my shoulder hurts. It's not fixable. I'm, it, you know, life is over, blah, 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 catastrophic thinking. You got to change that. Commit to being healthy. Make it consistent with your sense of self. If it worked <clears throat> in a prisoner of war camp to convert American soldiers to communist collaborators, I think it can work for you to make yourself healthier. Use achievable tactics to accomplish the strategy. Get good sleep. You can't do anything if your brain's tired. Get good nutrition. Can't do anything if your brain doesn't get that energy, if the mitochondria aren't pumping out ATP like we talked about. If you don't have the right micronutrients to make the serotonin, reduce the stress so you don't have cortisol destroying everything. Take supplements if you need to, to get the brain health right. Control your mindset. Know thyself. Use self-control. Modify the pain signal. Control how you feel. All this is possible. Exercise. Get a healthy brain. But commit to saying believe in yourself is what I'm trying to get you to understand here. And help yourself out. An inflamed and a tired brain cannot engage in a healthy mindset. It is what it is. You got to get on a good circadian rhythm. You got to get the right micronutrients. Probably with some, I take a lot of supplements because I just don't have time or ability to eat the healthy, beautiful way I would like to. Uh, time restricted eating is a great trick that you can use. And I'm a big believer in that. Good sleep, good hydration. Your brain also needs hydration. If you're dehydrated, your brain can't function right either positive thoughts. All, if you have negative thoughts, just be aware of them. 
know why you're having the negative thoughts and try to add a positive thought to it. Mindfulness and meditation has been shown to be extremely helpful. Why? Because they reduce levels of cortisol, which reduces stress, which reduces inflammation and oxidative stress. And then anything to reduce stress. One of the best tools, exercise. <clears throat> so speaking quickly about health control, I mean, sorry, health control. I guess it is health control. Self-control. Think about this. Eating a donut should take more fundamental effort than not eating it, right? You have to go in the room. You have to pick it up. You have to open your mouth. You have to put it in your mouth you have to chew. You have to swallow. Your body has to digest it and distribute the chemicals everywhere. That's a lot of effort. Why is it that not eating the donut seems so much more effortful? This comes down to self-control. This is when you do something, you inhibit your dominant response now, your instant gratification now for the betterment of your future self. That is the definition of self-control. The self alters your behavior patterns <clears throat> to inhibit the dominant response. It is a massive mental exertion. That's why eating a donut does not take more effort than not eating a donut, even though when you think about the actual energy expenditure, it should, right? What's happening is you are trying, you have to alter your innate behavior pattern that is built up over years that has become your dominant response. And it's a massive exertion. But you can build your self-control like you can build a muscle. But you have to have good brain health. You have to have a strong dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is the executive control function. Again, all trainable. But if you discipline yourself, then others won't need to or won't get to. Because right now, if you don't have self-control and self-agency and an internal locus of control and optimism and positive thoughts, then you are a victim of the medical community and the industrial community, et cetera, et cetera. You need a reserve in your brain to have this self-control ability. That's why you got to get good sleep, good nutrition. I put Arnold Schwarzenegger here because he is an example of the master of self-control, if you think about it. Um, I mean, he became Mr. Universe. I think he was under 20. It's just unbelievable, his story. Depletion events will make it hard to get self-control. So the more often you have to exert massive mental effort to fight your dominant response, the harder it becomes. So the more often you're tempted, that last little bit of temptation, particularly if your brain is fatigued, it's going to be the hardest to resist, right? And that's when you usually give in. You have to change the way you think, feel, and behave about stuff. We already talked about that. Delayed gratification is the whole fundamental thing of self-control because the whole point of having self-control is to make your future self better, right? Avoid the instant gratification, that instant dopamine hit that you have been, um, I'm sorry, that has been used against you, okay? It's not like doing math. It's not even like running or anything, right? Like there are things that take effort that are effortful, but they're not, they're not as hard as self-control. So if, if you're doing a bunch of math problems, yes, it takes a lot of mental effort and energy, but it's not that you're trying to ignore an innate desire that you have. So if I told you to do 100 math problems right now, it would be maybe annoying and hard, but it won't be as massively exhausting to your brain as if I told you to avoid a temptation like don't eat that donut. Isn't that crazy when you think about it? But once you become aware that that's what's going on, it suddenly becomes easier to have self-control. Not all effortful behaviors are self-control. Go ahead, sorry. <clears throat> so how do you build this muscle of self-control? Believe it or not, let's say you wanted to start engaging in a growth or a health mindset, or you wanted to stop eating, ultra, uh, let's pick two ultra-processed foods, let's say refined white bread and sugar sodas. Let's say I'm going to not eat those for two months. If you think that you're somebody that has no self-control, before you do that two-month trial where you're going to try to cut out those terrible foods, I would take a month or two and do small acts of self-control before that. Work on your posture every day. Sit up straight every day for a couple months, even a couple weeks. Don't say cuss words for a couple weeks. Try not to yell at your kids for a couple weeks. Uh, write a positive thought about yourself for a couple weeks every day. Write a goal every day. Pick a new instrument, try to learn it. Tell yourself you're going to read a book every day. Not every, not obviously a whole book, but you know what I mean. So engage in small acts of self-control before you try to do the self-control, the true effortful suppression of your innate desire to make your future self better. And you'll be able to do it. This has been shown to, this has been proven. So if you engage in just something as silly as sitting up straight for two weeks, you're going to be able to resist the donut better than if you didn't do that beforehand. 
So again, another little trick for you to use. Okay, and set yourself up for success. So one of the better ways to have good self-control and good self-discipline is to keep yourself out of situations that are gonna induce poor self-control. So in other words, I'll give you an example from my life. I used to love breakfast cereals. I used to love Lucky Charms. I used to love um, Raisin Bran, whatever, whatever the breakfast cereal. Once I realized how bad for me they really, really were, the only way I could really keep myself from eating them was to not have them in the house. So I stopped putting them in the house. Then over a period of time, I didn't even want them anymore. Now I don't want them, I'm uninterested. But until I took that step of reducing the mental effort it was gonna take to avoid eating them, I don't think I would have gotten there. So if your weakness is, let's say, red Cokes, try not to buy any. But if you have a desire to get one one day, just go get it, but don't make it easy for yourself. But don't beat yourself up. If you take the effort to get off the couch, get in the car, drive to the gas station, buy a red Coke and come home and drink it, don't beat yourself up. But I would make it that hard. And then that's going to help you gain the self-control. And that's just one example, right? Just different eating things. There's plenty of areas in life we could all do better with self-control, right? But those are some examples for health-related reasons of how to avoid temptation and make it easier to avoid temptation. Go to bed early. If you go to bed early, odds are you're not going to be partying all night or eating food at night. If you're asleep, you're probably not going to be eating, I hope. So go to bed early. Avoid the temptation. Make it easier on yourself. Don't put processed foods in your pantry. Send someone to shop for you with a list. How about that? Don't get tempted at the grocery store. Different little tricks like that, I think, can help you enhance your brain health, which will help you get a growth and a health mindset. And then good supplements to help reduce the inflammation in, brain, in your brain and help your brain function better. Here's a short list. Omega-3s, hugely important, and I'm going to talk about them. Tryptophan, 5-HT, serotonin, Alcar, L-tyrosine, Chaga, Cordyceps, Reishi, Lion's Mane, Ashwagandha. All of those are derived of mushrooms, which are massively healthy for your brain. Guarana, Bacopa, Nuopept, and Phosphatidylserine. We're going to talk about a few of these now. So let's say that you're not in the position or don't have the capacity to eat a beautiful Mediterranean diet with nine servings of fruits and vegetables every day and whole grains and et cetera, et cetera. Um, one way to sort of help your brain get healthy to get into that growth and health mindset is to supplement. Lion's mane is a great one. It's been shown to improve focus, to improve energy levels, to help those neuro connections and the plasticity and the pruning back of bad connections and the expansion of good connections. So lion's mane is a great one. Omega-3s, I think Everyone should be on omega-3s personally. Uh, they reduce inflammation in general throughout the body. They just don't even give the body the chance to make bad inflammation. They make all cell membranes a bit more fluid, so all the receptors function better. And DHA in particular is extremely important for the neuronal cell membranes and myelin sheaths and things like that. So <clears throat> taking omega-3s is going to be hugely helpful for your brain. You're not going to notice an effect for 60 to 90 days because these things actually, actually have to get incorporated into the cell membranes. But like most things with natural health, you're not going to feel that synthetic immediate effect like you would with, say, a Norco. You don't want that. If you feel an immediate effect from something, usually it's not natural. Omega-3 is hugely important. Lion's mane, massively important. Both improve focus, both improve energy, and both reduce inflammation in the brain. Alcar, which is acetyl L-carnitine, it enhances the function of another neurotransmitter, acetylcholine. So its combination of acetyl-CoA, which is a fundamental energy um, building block, and then choline. It gives you better cognition or focus. It's a nootrope, and it's derived of lysine and methionine, which are amino acids, right? It helps your mitochondria function. Remember the, one of the first slides I showed you, the brain mitochondria? So Alcar actually helps the mitochondria utilize energy better, particularly in the brain, and it'll increase your noradrenaline and your serotonin levels. Now, that's been in preclinical or animal studies, and it reduces brain inflammation. So Alcar, lion's mane, omega-3, all of these things are going to help your brain so that you can get that growth mindset to help your brain, to help your growth mindset, so on and so forth. Tryptophan and 5-HT. So a lot of us don't eat enough tryptophan in our diet, which is one of the precursor molecules to not just serotonin, but also melatonin. There, here's a list of some foods you can have that have more tryptophan. I personally take tryptophan, 
Um, and 5-HT will both help you with social cognition or your um, emotional awareness, your empathy, your ability to gauge with, engage with others. It reduces aggression, reduces irritability, and it allows you to have a better ability to have moral um, evaluation of, of different temptations and things like that. Um, and then emotional recognition tasks. So understanding somebody's emotions or intentions, more importantly, understanding your own emotions and your own intentions. Charles Swindle said, life is 10% of what happens to you, 90% of how you react to it. So stuff's gonna happen to you. There's gonna be injuries, it's gonna be disease, bad things happen, but what can change is your mindset or your beliefs and attitudes about it and how you respond to it. But without these fundamental micronutrient building blocks, you can't, you, you're just not gonna be able to. So tryptophan 5-HT, omega-3 is lion, lion's mane alcar, all improve focus, cognition, and energy levels in the brain. Yeah, so it's a serotonin precursor. <clears throat> Chaga, less brain inflammation again. Remember I told you one of the fundamental enemies to your brain is inflammation, oxidative stress. We don't want that. So anything that can reduce brain inflammation is a good thing. Boost cognition, improves memory and focus and concentration. And people that take Chaga have been shown to have higher brain function and better mindsets. So again, this whole family of mushrooms are remarkably beneficial for the brain. Cordyceps, this is actually an entomopathogenic fungus. So it's from the Himalayas. It's $12,000 per kilogram. It's one of the most valuable substances on earth. Uh, it is a very similar in structure to adenosine. Adenosine is a precursor molecule to ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate, which is your energy molecule. Also, adenosine is what builds up during the day to give you sleep pressure in your brain and is what caffeine blocks the adenosine receptor. That's how caffeine keeps you alert. So cordyceps is a precursor, gives you this molecule that looks just like adenosine, and it's very antioxidant in the brain and very anti-inflammatory. Very expensive, but very good for you. And then reishi mushrooms, again, more mushrooms, right? Calms the mind or calms the shen in Chinese medicine. It has also been called the mushroom of immortality. It's been called the food of the gods and the Romans. It's been called the 10,000 year mushroom in the Japanese societies. It's filled with terpenoids and polysaccharides, <clears throat> which are mo micronutrient molecules that make the mitochondria function well and reduce inflammation and oxidative stress. And then it also modifies the immune system to your benefit and reduces inflammation. All of this to help with what? Mindset, focus, energy. Ashwagandha. Withania somnifera. This is an adaptogen, again, another sort of in the mushroom slash adaptogen family. Adaptogens make everything balanced. This is how cannabinoids work, right? <clears throat> so you have an endocannabinoid system that is the balanced system. So it'll make sure that no particular system is hyperactive or underactive. The body loves balance. It loves homeostasis. Adaptogens help you get there, which means they help your mindset be balanced. Ashwagandha is great for that. It'll help support any stressful situation where you have worry and anxiety. And there are many stress sources. What's happened in your childhood, what happened in your past, your job, your family, your finances, your environment. We're bombarded with stress in America. All we can do is fight back and get a better mindset about it. The stress is not going anywhere. Ashwagandha is helpful. So... I've given you a lot of information, a lot of tricks and tools, but basically just know that things can change and they should change and you can control how you feel. You can control pain. You can control recovery. You can even control disease, right? But you have to kind of do it all together. We need a new mindset if we want new results. Patton said, if everybody is thinking alike, then somebody isn't thinking. Groupthink is your enemy. We are surrounded by groupthink. If you notice that a lot of people are thinking the same thing and nobody has an aberrant thought, there's something probably not right there. Uh, mindset is hugely important to your health. I don't think I'm the first person to say it. I'm certainly not gonna be the last person to say it. It's not prevalent in clinical medicine yet, but hopefully it will be. It'll change your pain level, your healing potential, your recovery, your resiliency to stress, your self-control, your ability to reduce stress, and your energy and your focus. So just remember you have neuroplasticity and you can change it based on the inputs you give the brain. Is that it? So things you can do. Think positively whenever possible. 
eventually the negative thoughts will be reduced. If you find that you have a lot of negative thoughts about stuff, don't focus on the negative thoughts and beat yourself up about the negative thoughts because that's just another negative thought. Rather, if you notice you're thinking negatively, like let's say you're stuck in traffic and all you can have are negative thoughts, change the game. Think to yourself, you know what? No one's bothering me and I get to sit here and I'm just going to listen to the podcast and the music that I want and this is a great day. Make it something positive. Don't try to crowd out the negativity because you're just adding another negative thought to a bunch of negative thoughts. Get good sleep, can't emphasize it enough. A tired brain is never going to have a good growth health mindset. I'm a big believer in a circadian rhythm and try to keep it very strong. Try not to deviate. Have a good wake-up time, have a good bedtime, don't change it. Try to get the micronutrients you need to support brain health so that you can have a growth and a health mindset. And guess what? Most of the same micronutrients in turn help your bone, your muscle, your blood vessels, your heart, your nervous system, et cetera, et cetera. Brain health, reduced inflammation equals better mindset by definition. Exercise, 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 hugely important. More BDNF for your brain, okay? Every time you move, you're giving yourself brain-derived neurotrophic factor, a neurotrophic factor. And then set yourself up for better self-control. Assist yourself. You know, make your life a little bit easier for that effortful avoidance of instant gratification for your future better self. Self-control is hard by definition. Try to give yourself some tools to make it easier. All things are difficult before they are easy, right? Concert pianists didn't wake up one day being a concert pianist. Marathon runners didn't wake up one day being a marathon runner. Surgeons didn't wake up one day being a surgeon. You know, everything is difficult until it's not. So just don't beat yourself up. This is going to be a hard path until it's not. And that's going to happen sooner than you think. If you improve by 1% a day in just 70 days, you're twice as good. Think about that. Just make baby steps, smart goals that are achievable and write them down and commit. And that's what I have for you for mindset, which was a lot. I get it. <laughs> so I don't know if anybody has any questions, but these are my uh, supplements to support brain health, just so you know. But, you know, obviously the best thing you can do is exercise and sleep. And I just, I just cannot emphasize that enough. And then just add positive thoughts to your negative thoughts. Become self-aware. Know thyself, know thy enemy. Know what is aligned against you to deprive you of health. Basically the whole world. We just have to fight back. But you can't fight back unless you know you're being attacked and you know how you're being attacked. But now you do.